Tapan Bhakti, I am one of your instructors. The subject we are starting today is uh, project management. It is a pretty large undertaking as a course and uh, the, as I was discussing with one of your classmates, the practices in project management, they differ somewhat from what you study in books, but there is value on both sides. There is the practitioner's guideline, which is the Pembok book I will be showing you and also the textbook which covers various theoretical methods which you need to optimize the process. So there is value in both, value in learning both and we got to make sure we master both hands. And this course is going to be a blend of both. There is going to be a good part of theory, some exercises to work out and also we will make sure you get the exposure and practice in true project management. Most of the examples that you will be looking at would be sharing your own examples because many of you have working experience and what I will be expecting is that uh, you will recall those instances or those project opportunities where you are probably either a project manager or you are a team leader or you are a project resource or you are a sponsor of the project or you are basically someone interested in just seeing a project take place. So that way you would have a lot of involvement in bringing in practical know-how into this. That is how the learning is going to be wholesome, it is going to be complete. My process is going to be essentially using PowerPoints which I will be do using to a great degree and I like I promised to you, I will be uh, emailing these ahead of time so you will all have files of all the slides that I have. In addition, I will be also giving you material from time to time which will be uh, taken from various sources. I will be usually acknowledging the sources. Many of these are made by my students, can you believe? Even the slides you will be looking at, many of those came from people like you who made the presentation then we decided that we will incorporate that in this thing. So in fact, it is a very rich collection of material on project management. In addition, I also will have PMBOK material which I will be using. I will be using this guidebook. This will be uh, one of the guidebooks we will be using. This is uh, put out by the PMBOK PMI Institute and this is the sum and substance of the reflections of practicing managers, practicing project managers. This material also will be shared with you and uh, as I have shown you in the, uh, the uh, presentation schedule for different groups, I trust you have already made the groups, you will be focusing on the part that is listed against your group's name and that will be the chapter that you will be covering. Essentially I do not want you to get too deep into theory because that will be done by me. You bring in practice, you bring in as much of the uh, practicing world as possible and uh, so the group should get together and you should really take your presentation itself as a small project. What is the charter? What is the scope? What are the deliverables? And then you get into detailed planning of it. Some person will probably organize the materials, somebody will look through some examples, somebody will sequence them right and someone is going to put it all together in a PowerPoint. The presentation can be done, generally it is done by members of the group so that will be done on day 2, so today is like day 1, Tuesday and Wednesday will be day 2, that will be your turn. So the first half an hour tomorrow, it will be me sitting here and in the later half, your group takes over and you basically tell us about that chapter. Now this will happen starting next week, not this week. So you get the time to uh, look through this, you look through the material and so on. On the internet, you will find a lot of related material, so it is not going to be just the uh, PMBOK guide or the textbook that you will be referring to, obviously you will have some of your practical experience that will be there. So make a, make a list of that and focus in the presentation only on that aspect of the project that you are describing that leads to that day's topic. So if it is like scope, figuring out scope, then you try to recall how did we figure out the scope of this project. All these concepts I will be covering today. So I will give you the overview of complete project management today itself. So you will have a pretty good idea of what all is involved in uh, basically conceiving, then planning, then executing and then closing down a project. We will walk through the four steps. Later on in the following lectures, we will be go going deep into any of those topics. We will be going through a lot of those topics, a lot of those details and so on and in some cases we will be working out some numericals also. So we will set the ground today for CPM PERT, we will try to do that today. Tomorrow in the first half an hour, you will try to work out some numericals. I will give you some assignments which will come from the textbook and the textbook happens to be this book. 
which is the book by uh, Meredith and Mantel, fifth edition. It's published by Wiley, and it's called Project Management: A Managerial Approach. Now, this book pretty well. It's like any other book on project management. I found it to be reasonably readable, although it's a little verbose. It's a little, uh, you know, there are probably too many words in certain places, but it's a good reference to have. But you are free to use any book that you want. Just make sure when I assign a certain numerical, like on CPM or something, you refer back to this book and you go to that particular uh, topic, in fact, particular question, and you tackle the problem there. Again, you could study this in a group mode. Like I was telling you yesterday, the best way to really learn any subject is now that you have groups, the group should get together for about half an hour. And what the group should do is basically walk through the lecture from beginning to the end as if you are sitting in the class and pretty soon they'll be mounting these things on web also so you'll be able to review it again if certain parts are not clear you'll be able to go back and review it again that way you'll have a pretty good grasp of what the concepts were then try to find out if the instructor gave you any examples any illustrations and so on if it was all clear then that's fine if something was not clear again you discuss among yourselves this way believe me your learning is going to rapidly climb and like I told you yesterday, I do not want anyone in this class to get less than A. My minimum mark, marks awarded here should be A. It will be between E X and A. That's how, that's how I'd like to grade it. I really like, like to, uh, you know, if I give you the feeling that you, you learn something from this, also you end up with a happy ending. It's a pretty intensive course. There's going to be a lot of work to do for you and for me, and we'll go through it, I'm pretty sure. I've already been talking to some of you, and I've, I've realized some of you have project experience. And so, if you are very eager to get into this, if you got like for dissertation or some other, uh, you know, engagement, if you want to do a project, and again, uh, come and see us at uh, some other time, perhaps after the class, and then we'll try to see what we could do to try to help you along. That also is definitely possible. With this, let's try to see if I would uh, start with the PowerPoint. So the topic is project management. examples of projects many examples are there in fact uh, it turns out most of our life it does not go into production it actually goes into working project after project after project some examples are here contract software development I'm sure pretty several of you have been involved in that building construction finding a job is a project getting admitted in uh, VGSOM that was a project then the large ones building the aircraft carrier or putting up the uh, space station up there r and projects, many of, you are, many of you have worked on those things, audits, ad campaigns, new product introduction, open or close a facility, this could be something that is not going to be used later, so you want to close it down or probably you want to open a new one, making a movie is a project, a wedding is a project, fundraising campaigns, these are all one-time undertakings. And the distinct thing about projects is that each has a work breakdown structure. That is something, work breakdown structure is basically a list of deliverables which are arranged in some hierarchy and we'll, we'll get, a, get a glimpse of this as we go into the uh, project, uh, it will, we'll take a, get a glimpse of uh, WBS, that's something we'll be learning at, looking at. Even large projects obviously, they are, they all have the same, pretty well the same personality, whether it's a small project, you know, put to, putting together PowerPoints for your next presentation or building a bridge like this, they are all the same. The good thing about uh, knowing some, you know, methods is that if you manage your project according to some framework, like for example, this uh, PMBOK framework, if you do it that way, you can control the cost of your project, you can control the time to finish this project, you can also make sure it comes under, under within budget and so on, and user satisfaction is maximum. All those things can be accomplished if you manage your project with some systematic framework. And that's the goal, that's the goal for learning projects this way. Typically, if you walk into a project manager's office, you'll see walls that have these uh, these uh, Gantt charts. And the Gantt charts, they kind of look like this. They have activities, then each activity ends up with a milestone. That's something that's very, very common among all projects. Then one milestone, when it is done, it will move on to the next milestone, and so on and so forth. It keeps going like that. There is some sequencing there. This sequencing, actually, it is technologically determined. 
I can't arbitrarily do the last part first. I just can't do it because there is a technological dependency in every activity that is there. If you're going to be spending any time on any activity, there's a right time for it. There's a right duration for it. Those things are paramount. Those things are critical. That's why we always have this sort of framework to, to, to display what is going on. Now, there is, a, there is a definition that is given by the PMBOK people, the standards people. They say it's a unique one-time operation designed to accomplish a specific set of objectives in a limited time frame. And you all know that's what a project is. That's not what production is like. In production, you produce the same stuff a thousand times. That's not what we're doing here. In fact, many of you, if you are aware of this, many of you who work for a large software company, they would like to know if you have some orientation in project management. In fact, if you have some good credentials, which has been certified by someone, and the PMI certification is one that is sought after very, very, you know, a lot. Many people would like to have someone on the team member who is a PMI certified person. This way, they get an edge over other people who do not have people who have the PMI orientation. So that's like something that, again, highlights the value of doing this systematically. <clears throat> Many people are frustrated. The moment you bring in any kind of system, you say you've got to follow a particular system. To do the job right, you've got to follow a certain system. And you get reactions. If somebody tells me I have to wake up at 6 a.m., I have to review my slides, at 7 I have to get down, get my breakfast, and so on and so forth, I say, why are you, why are you giving me these timings? You leave it to me, I'll do it. The problem is this. Those reactions are just human reactions. And they see this sort of thing. Someone who is doing research, like Dr. Bakshi does some research. And if you tell me, if the director tells me in one year you are supposed to publish two papers, I immediately begin to react. I say, my God, that's a creative work. How can you fix a quota on this? How can you give me time for it? Research is such a freewheeling thing, I can't really plan it. I can't really give you any kind of thing. I cannot commit to any schedules because I have no idea what activities are going to be involved in this. That's like a human reaction. In fact, I do not even know many times how it's going to work out. So how can I plan on something? I have no idea what it's going to end up with that I just do not have. And also probably I'm going to be busy working on the project. Where do I have the time for it? The, the reaction is this. The response from the professionals is this. A project plan is a map and a guide. Just a few weeks ago, I was trying to get back to the uh, railway station. There were some guests there. And I was trying to get to the Hijli, the, the uh, Kharagpur railway station. And believe me, I'd been driven back and forth four or five times, and I thought I knew the road. Sure enough, as soon as I crossed the bridge, and then I just didn't know where to turn. I ended up turning in a farmland. I ended up someplace, and people said, well, that's not where the railway station is. You have to make these other things. And they showed me a shortcut. And you believe me, shortcuts are you know, what they are. So that's what ended up happening, because I did not have a plan. I had not bothered looking up a map. I hadn't talked to anyone. I started to work without a plan. The result was it took me driving. It took me 45 minutes to get to the railway station, which should take maybe 15, 20 minutes. That's it. So that's like a lesson. If there is no map, most likely we'll get lost. If there is no plan, the project will get upside down. It just won't work right way. Then there are other issues. There's the issue of trade-off between, we'll see what trade-offs like. Trade offs are like. You sometimes trade off between cost and time. Sometimes you may even have to compromise the scope. You may have to cut back some things. Like in many times in software development, they say the user, after a while he comes back, he says, well, I want the screen to be doing this. I want an interactive something there and so on and so forth. I want a small database to take care of this. I want to have a special report that will do this. You already have your plan in place. Any of these things must come in as change requests. And changes would impact the original plan. If I don't have a plan to begin with, my God, it's all going to be topsy-turvy. So that's why, again, the importance is that you've got to have these plans in place before you can work out those trade-offs. Then there's a huge issue. You control the activities, you control the resources, you control the contract, and so on. And you try to do things as per your plan. That's what you normally try to do whenever you're doing project management. But there are so many things which are not in your control. The weather, somebody quits. Some equipment doesn't work, raw material does not arrive, or there's some calamity or something. As a result, the project gets disrupted. For these things, we have to foresee as much as possible. We've got to foresee these things. It's like when we start from the hostel, we have to reach here by, let's say, 25. We would make sure if it's like a rainy day, we'd give extra time. 
again if it's deep winter a lot of fogs will give extra time if it's a nice sunny morning you know spring morning will probably take the minimum time to get here now here there's some variation based on this uncontrolled variable uncontrolled factor which is weather so for this we got to do some risk management so this is also something we got to do when we whenever we are doing a project we got to get a very clear picture of the various risks involved in the project and make sure we come up with a risk plan a risk management plan and we implement it so alongside getting your resources and everything else you also got to make sure you got a risk management plan in place so that when these things happen you got a way to do this we'll get a lot deeper into this as we get into the subject then obviously if there's going to be a change there like i mentioned change control if you have a plan it should also incorporate this change management plan which i'm pretty sure those of you who are in it you already work with these things the change must be authorized by the appropriate authority because if you change things without telling him it may cost you more time it may cost you more money and so on and so forth you may not have the skills for it and so on and so forth so it's got to be approved by someone who then negotiates this with the sponsor is the sponsor willing to live with that longer time the, the the delay in the delivery of the project is he willing to give you the extra money to be able to run the project to be able to complete the project those things are there and obviously another thing that happens when you've got a good plan is you are able to communicate you're able to communicate with with your resources with the contractors with management with sponsors and so on and so forth if you have a good plan in place you have something specific to discuss if you don't have that if you don't have the specificity people find communications to be very vague they don't know what you said no minutes are kept and all those things and for that again we got to have a good plan to begin with so it's like something we cannot really escape there are various people who are interested in the success of the project and first and foremost is the project sponsor he's the guy who makes a business case in his head he makes a business case in his head for the value of the project he's the one who determines we got to have a overpass built here we got to have this term paper written we got to have this new product developed we got to move the class from one place to another place we have got to go to a different location so on he's the one who makes a business case for it in his head sponsor is the person who normally also comes up with the resources but the sponsor himself is not the project manager for this we employ people who are called executives and certainly the project manager is going to be one of those executives there may be other people also but the project manager is a key executive the executive actually is the executor he really runs the project right from the beginning he does not only do the execution he also does the, does the planning he does he helps the sponsor to try to do a good selection and so on and so forth and he also hands over the project when the project is complete that is there the resources are again not the project manager alone he forms a team we have a team the team basically brings in different types of skills if the members of the team they come from various places i worked on a technology transfer project back in 1975 i was an employee of exxon mobil and because of our performance in the company seven of us we worked in different places in the us i was in new jersey people were in texas some people were in california some were in canada and so on we were brought together because of the know how that we had because of the skills that we had i was a industrial systems engineer and i understood technology pretty well and i also had some background in automatic control and so on and so forth so i was put on that team there the sponsor actually said the sponsor was one of our vice presidents he said this is 1975 pretty soon people have to be removed from the plant people have to be removed from the plant the workers they'll have to be removed from the plant so the charter of the project is you go out scan around and try to find who are the people who can give us automated process control systems then you figure out all the software hardware business and everything then you guys do the engineering and then you go out and implement the project you install the project and you run the plant for 6 months under automation that's going to be your charter seven people were in that team the full seven people they came along and what they were supposed to do was they were supposed to bring their own know how own skills and do it this was one project where i found really the team thing there is one thing that you bring in as your as an individual there's got to be real good communication within yourselves of course i'll tell you about this case you know many times later we did not start with a good plan and the result was pretty close to disaster it was corrected of course by management halfway through the project and that story is going to come back again as we go through our program as we go through our course i'm going to bring this case again and again there were a lot of learnings there sponsor 
finances the project, he you know, puts aside the time and money and management and so on and so forth to make sure that the project gets done. People who benefit from the project are the customers. They are the ones who really gain the benefits of it. So again, that's a distinct group. When you try to establish the scope of the project, that means what are the deliverables, what things will be included, what will not be included, the sponsor will usually tell you, here's a group of customers, go and talk to them, they will tell you what we need. Then you start your planning. You start your planning from there. Don't, don't do your planning just because you have some background in automation or something. Don't do it that way. Talk to the users and this is the best way. I'm pretty sure you know, you know the closer you are to the customer, the more involved he is in you know, defining the project, the higher is going to be his satisfaction in the end. Then a major resource in your project, in your project is going to be the contractors. They are the guys who are doing the job for you. They are the ones who have to be given what we call work packages. So in an IT company, for example, you have contractors or you, you may even outsource some of the things. So there will be some purchasing involved. Like for example, when PISRO launched this PSLV rocket, they outsourced fabrication of this satellite and also fabrication of the satellite launching vehicle to a company. This was the private company took it over and they built things. They were subcontractors. If there are other people going to be involved, for example, contractors, subcontractors, they also have to be managed. So this is also a very large task in project management. You got to manage these contractors. If you don't do this, they will just wait for the final check at the end of the day. They won't really bother with, for example, all, it all depends on the terms that you have with him, the, the agreement that you have with him as to how he's going to be paid. But generally speaking, there's got to be site inspection, there's got to be quality checks, there's got to be certification that yes, that work package is complete, only then you make the payment and so on and so forth. Then you've got functional managers. Who are these functional managers in our organization? Speak a little loud. Exactly, good, yes. More functional managers. Yes, good. They are, they are people, they have people, they have designers. This is a design group. Your project requires a designer. You won't probably hire a designer for the, for, for the life of the project. You'll probably tap into this design group. You'll probably tell them, tell the functional manager, I need two designers. One should know AutoCAD, the other should know whatever interfacing is required and so on and so forth. That's what I need for this. And you'll do the same thing with production people. Some input may be required there. Purchasing people may have some people there. So all these verticals, they'll provide you things. These verticals are functional verticals. They're not necessarily people who will deliver a particular product for you, but they will do the thing. Again, to remind you what is it that we are getting into, we are getting into a temporary undertaking, and that's going to be delivering a unique product or service. So you have the project life cycle, the project life cycle, and what you end up delivering is the product or the service in the end. We'll see that in a few minutes. <clears throat> Some decisions have to be made as you are going into this project. Which project to implement? Now this is for the sponsor to figure out. You as a project manager, you as someone who understands the domain, you probably most likely will have some input there. You'll be able to say, sir, we'll let you uh, have a chat with uh, uh, Zim Premji or someone, and you know, a fellow who've been running this kind of thing, and they are, they are probably pretty seasoned in this area. I know you're pretty ambitious, you want to get into the IT area, and you want to create a new ERP software. You want to do it for the sponsor care industry people, for example. What kind of issues are involved and so on and so forth, Please, you know, we'll make sure that you get to interface with somebody that you know, the, who, who's an expert in this area. Deciding also would require, for example, not only sizing up the benefits, but also what's go, what is going to, the project is going to cost, how much time it is going to take, is that going to be okay for you? If you start a new, brand new refinery, it may take you five, six years to build it. Can you wait that long? What is the competitive position going to be of your company at that time? Will you be able to resource it and so on? Is the ROI going to be good enough? And above all, are the risks such that you can swallow the risk? You can live with them. Those issues are the ones that get into selecting the project, deciding which project to go on. We'll give you some more details on this. Selecting a project manager. And I'm pretty sure you understand. Now you've worked, there are some people you give your life, you give your right arm for. The other people you would stay away from. So you got to make sure there's like a natural attraction toward this person. He's got to be competent and everything else. And I'm going to be bringing up some skills which are besides the technological skills. I was speaking with one of your classmates and uh, we, we could figure out there are so many variables that are beyond our control. But the one that is worst is the human factor. There are so many people you have to deal with and personalities you have to deal with and so on. 
it's not going to be very easy to do it all but after all we got the charter to deliver the project the sponsor gives you the charter of the project and now again we we're going to clarify what exactly he does selecting the project team again this will depend again on our people uh, kind of you know they do they have the skills are they available and uh, are they easy to get along with and so on for those things would be there then of course the decision is going to be to plan and design the project basically this is going to be where your cpm part is going to come in once you have that clear it's pretty clear we're going to be doing the project this is the budget this is the time frame and so on and so forth we projected a finished deadline and now we we have to manage and control the project resources because project the project is going to be done with the help of these resources we are going to be there and you got to make sure those resources are available when you want them they are going to be available right there if they are not available project is going to be delayed so we'll see that we'll see some of these hurdles and these are these are again the common risk and we'll try to take a look at that sometimes you got to say enough is enough we got to terminate the project either we have delivered the deliverables that is something that we've done or it is not possible or there is the business scene has changed or something so if you look at pharmaceuticals for example they come up with so many new molecules you know the passion of a phd chemist is to come up with a new brand new molecule and it comes up with penicillin or something my god he is the king of the world so all of them they try just like you folks try in your own way to try to come up with that new magic software they try to see if they can come up with a new molecule so there are if you go to a typical company go to baxter any of them they probably have 50 or 100 chemists all phd's high five people just busy you know with their lab coats and all they're busy building these molecules and you know combining the various ways and so on 95 96 97% of these molecules they are put in the down can there because they are not viable for various reasons they fail the animal test they fail something else they are not stable they don't have good shelf life they are not effective you know these are some of the things that are almost critical you got to have those things in order for you to succeed in the project so many times we have to decide mercilessly good work great work you will get your promotion but we can't move with this project anyway so that's like also something we got to decide should i terminate the project now or should it go on for a while we now come to the crux of it like if you got a project you have you obviously got specifications these are the requirements that's what is written down when you interact with the sponsor first and then your your client the customer the users of your product or service that's the place where you record and i'm pretty sure you've gone through for example to figure out what software to build you've done a lot of these things the the requirements this is kind of a funny area because many times the user doesn't know what he wants and because the user has not used it he still doesn't know what exactly is good for him that he does not know so many times he might he may like to get a partial experience of it so either you build him a prototype or you take him to a site where he crosses that bridge or walks over something or he uses the product and then he gets a feel oh my god i now i i think i understand you say i've got a new thing which is like a new mouse it won't have this cord with you but suppose the fellow is not used to this sort of thing then you got to expose him to this either through bluetooth or uh, you know some some ray or something so how it's going to be connected by wireless and so on if he's never experienced that he can't even tell you what all he requires so this is going to be the challenge in trying to make sure you specify this thing and it's got to be all formal it's got to be all written down once you got the specs you ask the question how am i going to be doing it then you start detailing the project i'm going to walk you through that we start with the charter the charter is make sure the customer is happy then you define the scope which tells you what things will be included in the product or the service and what things will be excluded will be kept out of it with that you get down to what we call wps the work breakdown structure and then then you do your planning and the planning will lead to your schedule and it will also lead to the deadline what is the deadline that's going to be a reasonable deadline for you to commit to so i end up with a schedule i got i got the sequence of all the different tasks and i end up with that and then i do my estimation i do two types of estimation one of course i've got the time estimates done and then money without money we won't be able to do the project so that has to be done and there are some cost engineering will have to be done some cost estimation methods will have to be done i will catch a glimpse of these things as we go along you'll end up finding that there are techniques available and i'm pretty sure some of you have probably used these things you know you have various kokomo method and so on both in the it world where you do the estimation the other places you have abc activity based costing and so on so with the help of that you end up costing the project 
it is actually not that difficult to do these things. If you follow the system and for many of these things systematic templates are available. If you just fill in the, the boxes you will end up with the right estimate. So, that is like something that you could easily keep in mind when, when you are approaching a project. But many times if you got to meet some stringent restrictions it may take you a long time, it may cost you a lot of money. Then you got to go back to the sponsor again you ask him sir tell us do you really need all those things is going to you know cost you so much money is going to take you so much time can you wait for one year before you get that product in your hand. Now that is where you end up doing trade offs between the objectives because the fellow probably has a deadline in mind because there is competition also working on something like that you got to make sure competition does not get there before you do number one it should also cost something that is within budget. You got a portfolio of various projects. You got to make sure, okay, I've got these five products coming up. Within the next two years, we'll have these five products coming up. The first one is going to be out in six months, then one year, then 15 months probably, and so on and so forth. That's how you've laid them out. You got to make sure it fits into the portfolio, and it actually is a is a viable thing for your company to do. So you'll probably keep looking at the ROI also on this. That's when your objectives and trade-offs those would come along. That's like something part that is part and parcel of this. So, we talk about this trade off triangle. Again, we have the same three issues. We get the product, which has got your scope and performance, which is basically the requirements. From that, I come up with the requirements in terms of work requirements and I come up with the schedule. Then I do my cost estimation, I come up with the cost side of it. And then again, I go back to the sponsor and I tell them, if this is what you want, please make sure you have you allow us that much time, it's going to cost you so much. Then there's going to be some trade off some trade off between these things. He will probably say yeah it looks like it will be okay, but try to see if we could speed it up a little bit. I want to have like the product ready three months ahead of time. There is going to be some trade offs here. This only the sponsor can decide. The project manager should not decide. The project manager's job is to articulate this thing to make sure it is clear to the, the, the sponsor hears it very clearly to deliver these things is going to cost me so much, it is going to take so much time. Then you show him some trade offs also. I do a lot of research, you know I do a lot of analytical research and uh, research and software and so on. And many times when I come up with a solution, I also worry about the sensitivity. What if the parameter changes by 50 percent, what will be the impact? If you do this, you are a smart guy, you are a smart planner. Otherwise, if you just come up with one answer, the sponsor is going to again ask some questions and say, but how, what will happen if this happens, what is, what is going to happen now? You better work those out earlier, before ahead, before, before time sort of. That is something that you got to do. Stages of project management. Now, this may not be very clear on the slides here, but you please make sure that you uh, look up your PDF and you see what these boxes are. These are the major work categories. This is going to be obviously planning part and you will see it, see it in another light in a couple of minutes. You will see that. There is the planning part of a project. There is the scheduling part. Scheduling also gets into estimation of time and cost. Then you got the execution where you basically do your contract management and while these things are going on you got to control the project. Control alone make sure that you deliver what is wanted. So, control is like your feedback. Control is knowing yes I am on the right track, I am doing the right thing or it says you have deviated uh, either you have to work more or you have to put some more money to be able to do it. It can also say your quality assurance is poor. So, quality is another aspect that you should be looking at and you should try to make sure that you satisfy people on the quality front also. By far in my complete lecture, this is the most important slide. This is the slide that displays the life cycle of a project. You know about software development life cycle. This is for any project. You give me a project, I will be able to identify its parts, limb, size, nose and so on and so forth and I will be able to show you where exactly it fits here. Let us try to walk through this starting with a very broad view of this. There are four phases of the project. The first is of course, defining the project, conceptualizing and defining the project. The second is planning the project, working out the details. Now, I've defined what I want, I will be planning the details of the project. You do this in software development also. Then is the execution part, then is the execution part. Then of course, the last part is delivery. These are the broad four phases. In fact, if you look at the PMBOK guideline, they give you special methods to be utilized for definition, for defining the project. They give you special methods for planning, 
they give you special methods for execution and they give you special methods for delivery. I should also tell you that the planning part is not covered very well by PMBOK because that should involve some theory. And if your plan is poor, the whole thing is going to be trash. So you got to make sure your planning is done the best way possible and that's where you need theory. So when I say that you got to have good theory with you, you got to make sure you understand the principles behind critical path, for example, principles behind cost estimation, principles behind risk management, principles behind contract management and so on. If you keep those things in mind which come from this red book, the theory book, you are going to be much, much better off. The practical book, our PMBOK book, this is going to tell you how to do it. But it does not tell you actually, it will just give you the steps. But to do it the best that you can, you got to use some theory. So that's why we got to make sure we keep both things in mind. Theory alone will not make you a successful manager, successful project manager. And PMBOK, yeah, please. All right, I will, I will go through this. I'm going to walk through the details here. I'm going to be focusing on this. <coughs> the first one, which is the defining phase, this is the part when you interact the most, the project manager interacts the most with the sponsor of the project. And he starts by asking, what are your goals? What is the business case for this? And he tries to understand that. He tries to make sure he understands the goals of the project, the mission of the project. This is also in their language. This is called like in business world, we call it mission and so on and so forth. But in the language of project management, this is called the charter of the project. The charter pretty well gives you, you know, gives you in one nutshell, what exactly is this product, product project trying to accomplish. Once the goals are fixed, then you get more specific. You start interacting, if you accept it, and if you've been critiqued and so on and so forth, you accept that, and then the sponsor says, now interact with the users, and you determine the specification. So specification also is something that you'll be doing. You're not doing any planning yet. You're basically just trying to hammer down what all things I have to deliver. So there may be some discussions there and so on and so forth. So specs are given. There's a particular platform. Your new software must run on that platform because you invested heavily in that platform. So you got to make sure it, so that's like one of the requirements. Then you got feasibility. Feasibility with respect to time and feasibility with respect to the finance. Those things are there. And of course, skills. If these are sorted out right there, you'll have far less problems. And if you, as you, as you go deep into this, then you start defining, you slowly start defining the tasks. And the tasks are defined by looking at what we call the work breakdown structure. You look at each deliverable. In fact, in between, I've also defined the scope of the project. Scope basically tells you what all things will be included in the project and what will be kept out of it. So if you're designing a new car, for example, maybe you want to design a solar car as an example. Just for demo purposes, to demonstrate the technology, you won't really build a four-seater solar car, right? You probably build a single-seater solar car that will be sleek and so on and so forth and be able to, uh, you know, lightweight and all those things will be there. So, in fact, that pretty well defines what the product is going to be. So, you look at, again, the charter of the project, look at the scope of the project, then you look at deliverables. Then you start asking questions, how am I going to be delivering them? And you get to tasks. And I'm going to be giving some more details on that, how to get there. Then you also work out the details of the project team, who are the people who are going to be involved. And as, it, as was mentioned, there may be domain experts involved. And what would be their responsibilities? What would be their individual responsibilities? That is also something you've got to sort out now, and you form your team. Is it a communication plan? Yes, 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 yes. In fact, before you leave planning, you've got to have those things all, all sorted out. The reporting structure, the reporting hierarchy, the media of reporting, and all those things. And we'll be looking at techniques like earned value management and so on and various reporting things we'll be looking at. That's something that we'll be doing as we, as we go along. So let's say we are done with defining the project. We got the deliverables very clear. We got the tasks very clear. Then we keep breaking down those tasks to the point when it becomes like a work package. You start with one big deliverable. Then you end up with four or five work packages basically supporting it. And from that, I'll develop my schedule. I'll do my estimation. I'll get my budget done. I'll identify resources required, and now the risks. Risks are all those events that can foul up your consequences, your results. And on those three fronts, one, they may foul up the requirements, they may take you over budget, or they may take you beyond the uh, deadline, the committed deadline. So risks have to be identified, and we have a special lecture on this alone as to how to identify risks, 
how to mitigate them, how to do, how to decide to perhaps live with them, or how to have contingency plans so that in case things do foul up, what do we do then? The plan B, in our language, the plan B. Those things we'll have to do when we get into risk management. Then of course, staffing is there. This staffing is very critical. I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, three years ago, I was visiting the Haldia petrochemical complex. And uh, as you know, most of these plants, they have a gate and uh, the security is there. They check your ID and so on and so forth. I was from IIT, so there was really no sweat getting through it. But just as I approached the gate, I could not get there because the taxi fellow, he said, sir, there are a lot of people here at the gate. I don't think they'll let us in. These were daily wage people. And it turned out that a couple of days before that, the company, that the petrochemical plant has announced, had announced that we're starting a new unit and they'll be requiring laborers. So all these people, they knew that on, uh, you know, 6th of January, 2009, they are going to be all allotting some uh, jobs. They're going to be uh, hiring some people. So something like 1,500 people were there with the hope of getting a job there. Now, there were all kinds of people there. There were people who would dig ditches. There were people who would lay pipes. There were people who would do welding and so on. They were all there. The thing is, the staffing plan was not made clear to people. So even the designer or the quality check man, they all were there right from day zero. But this is, you're not going to be hiring these people all off the bat. Like your planners come in early, but planners don't stay there when you're doing execution. Then you've got contract managers. You've got quality assurance people. They don't really come when you're doing scoping and so on. There is no quality to be checked there. There's no product, no service at all. So you've got to make sure when you work out your staffing, your staffing, you have a profile. If certain skills will be required right early on. Certain other skills, they will come along later on. This has to be thought through. And this is why you need the experience in project management. You should have worked on projects. You should have managed some projects. And you should have run into some problems. If you guys, if you never had a tar puncture on you, if you never had a tar blow up on you, you would not be very careful on the road. It's a chalta hai. A friend of mine, when I uh, was in uh, New Jersey, a friend of mine told me, he did a penny test on my tire. I'll tell you later about the penny test. He took a Lincoln penny from his wallet and he checked something on my tire. I thought he was trying to scrape off something from my tire. But he just went with that penny and he, uh, he did this sort of thing. And he uh, then said, uh, Tapan, uh, watch out. You know, the right front tire, it's uh, worn out. And uh, I kind of looked at that tire. The tire looked fine. And I gave it a couple of kicks. It sounded okay, ting, ting, it was all okay. I said, oh, okay, 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 thanks. I'll, I'll check it out later. He said, no, Tapan, please watch out. The treads are getting thin. I mean, it's, it's like uh, it's getting close to this thing. I said, oh, okay, okay, I'll see. Lo and behold, on the same road, my tire blew up when I was doing 60 miles an hour. So it's something that, you know, I can brush it off and so on and so forth. The signals are there. So this is why you've got to have controls and the moment you get signals, from the system. The system is telling you, please help. Please don't stretch me anymore. And another incident take place, took place on a different car, the Honda that I have standing outside. As I was driving in Lokhanwala in Andheri, I heard some strange sound. Now you all know your mobikes. You also know your bicycles. You also know your four wheelers. If something strange happens with your vehicle, you know right away. Like you take a pen and you give it to a friend. Or you give you, you take a laptop, you give it to a friend, and he returns it after two days. That laptop behaves strange because he's done something to try to, you know, the, the same thing happens with vehicles also. Now, your vehicle, you are very familiar with all the sounds and everything. I had the window down and I heard some strange things, some strange repetitive things. I said, I have not heard this before, and there's no particular, no, no treads on the road. So they showed me repetitive things. Well, what could be wrong? And it just dawned on me, maybe one of the tires is, uh, you know, breaking up or something. I drove to a side and I found about two inches of the tire torn out. For some reason, it got torn out. But it was just that lucky chance that there, because I had I already had a blow up, I didn't have another blow up there. And as you know, in high speed, if you blow up, the tire can flip, the, the car can flip and so on. So, so those things happen. To try to take care of this, we'll be doing risk management. And we'll be looking at this. We'll, we'll do a bit of brainstorming. We'll try to find it. We'll take some projects. And because you guys will be making presentations, the, the team that is going to be handling risk, I hope very much, and you'll clear this before you actually come to the presentation here. I will help you also with your presentation in my office. I've got lots of time, so you come here, you've got an idea. 
you said so this is how we want to make our presentation you come along and do it i will be scoring your presentation i want all of you to get each one of you to get 10 out of 10 make sure it's a total business quality presentation that's what you do okay then we move into execution execution is where the contractor takes over his expectations should be very clear because he's just working on those work packages he does not work on variety of different things he just works on the work packages i have finished this then i pass it on to this guy he finishes that then he passes it on to somebody else and so on this sequence has to be right and every time there is a handover quality check has to be there so this is again some place where you need to put in an extra person who understands the domain he knows yes if it is brick layer you bring an experienced person not an engineer out of civil engineering you bring someone who actually builds houses and roads and so on and so forth he's the one who can talk about concrete he can talk about mixer and all those things he can probably do that's the kind of person you need there so you need quality control people there you need contract managers there and while things are going on many times you have to relay things back to the sponsor or to other management or to stakeholders and so on for that you need reports i will show you what specific reports are there for two things one is the schedule slipping you got to have your yellow flag or red flag go up the moment your schedule begins to slip number one number two am i going over budget for the amount of work done am i going over budget so that's like a pricing issue so there's a schedule variance that has to be reported captured and reported and there's a price variance that also has to be captured and reported if these are done you will be right on top then of course i check quality i check quality and i move to the last stage which is your delivery of the product this is actually a very important part here the customer for the first time they might be experiencing a software so for that what you have to do is you got to train him on that software you got to make sure the training is complete he understands what he has to do transfer the documents any documenting documentation that you have prepared and most likely those documentation would have been done while you're doing the execution someone might be preparing those documents as you're going along release the resources you don't need the carpenters and the 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 uh, the, uh, the dig ditchers and so on. you just don't need those people there so you'll be probably reassigning them somewhere else that's also something you'd be doing they obviously would like to get a promotion and all so please make sure your hr people know that this is coming up they'll be freeing up a lot of people they have to be probably assigned to different places all and so on and so forth then you do a post mortem which is like the lessons you learned from the project this also has to be done you please make sure that the project at the end it has this closing meeting not only the sponsor has to be happy not only the users have to be happy but there's got to be lessons learned and those lessons have to be documented for example maybe your risk management was not good enough and you ran into some snags maybe your estimations were not good enough and you ran into some snags before that maybe you didn't understand the requirements right or maybe the process of finding the requirements was not good enough maybe you didn't build a prototype right at the definition stage before you got in planning probably if you could have a model there like when we build a large model there the director looks at the building looks at the orientation and so on he even looks at for example would you believe what am i going to be planting the neem tree and the mango tree and so on and how the shade is going to move on the tree because when the classes are running you don't want scorching sun to be shining on the road on on the building so that's also something the director looks at so that's the kind of thing when i've got the prototype in front of me it becomes much easier for me to react and to make changes and so on so this is also something we got to keep in mind that's like the lessons learned there may be other issues also costing issues may be there staff reassignment there may be issues there and so on so forth and also you document things in such a way they can be retrieved this is like something that you would like to do i will continue in just a few minutes i'll be continuing any questions so far go ahead and fire a few questions sir you didn't talk about the cash flow in the program ah uh, not yet not yet we will get into that that's like when you justify your project there's got to be a cash flow analysis done roi done either you work out the npv or you work out i'll probably give you a handout on that i'll certainly do that any other question yeah regarding the project combination what is the major package in the contingency plan because what is a contingency plan in your mind contingency plan means backup planning backup planning Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, you should get into that right at the planning stage itself. What if things foul up? If things don't come out the way I plan, what would be done? What would be my action? You try to do that right there itself. 
I'll give you again more details. If, if you'd like to make the question more specific later on, I'll pick this up and I'll give you more details as to how to do it. More questions? Uh, see, man hours alone is probably not the only criteria. What skill levels are required? Yeah, it's, it's very important. But as you will see as we flip through the slides, the biggest one, the biggest one in my mind, and I, actually this is the reflection of many project managers, is the people skills. If you got the right people skills there, people have a lot of fun. They deliver just the wonder. If, if, if that is the people skills are not there, the project, nobody likes the project and somehow it rolls along and so on and you declare a, a, a thing and you don't get full payment also on it. So I will say probably the foremost thing to look out, look out for is uh, having the right project manager, having the right team members there, having the right domain expertise there and having clarification, real clarity in requirements. If those things are there, the rest of it, you know, you're not inventing a new pharmaceutical molecule or something. It's something people have been doing it before. Because your database, your learning and all, it again enters history. And once it enters history, it's there for you to tap on. So you'll be basically looking at earlier projects also to try to see what was their history. If they built a bridge or something, what was the history like? Go ahead. Any other question? Yeah, please. Uh, we have a plan for the project, but how do we actually track the progress? Do we have qualitative measures or is just the experience or expertise that we No, no. There are, there are uh, like, like one of the techniques I'll be giving you is EVM, earned value management. When you're paying the paying the contractors, you're paying the money for a certain amount of work done. He could be slipping on schedule or his prices might be slipping. And you need to have this distinction clarified very well in your reports. So I'll show you actually, actually how to do this. Something else I'd like to suggest to you, once you get the project book, the project management book, uh, install the MS project on your uh, laptop. So we'll start building some projects also. In fact, if you've got your old projects there, try to see if you can put them on the MS project format. I'll cover some of the basics there, but please install MS project on your system so that we can interact. Uh, we'll take a short break, and uh, after that, we we'll resume again. Thank you. <laughs>